be sure to follow me on Instagram. There you can hang out with me and talk to me directly. What's going on guys, this is Rob. And in this video, I wanted to talk about the idea of Marvel 2099 on Disney Plus, right? Because I think it would work exceedingly well, like with all the stuff that they're doing. So uh, what's Marvel 2099, right? Like of what use would we be as a comic book YouTube channel that explains things if we were like, this would be a great idea. Thanks for watching guys, peace. <laughs> that'd be a terrible, it'd be a terrible example of comics explained. Um, so Marvel 2099 was an imprint that was launched in 1992 and ran for about six years to 1998. And I'll explain why here in a second, but um, it was a it was a super popular concept when it first popped up, right? Because it really came out of like Spider-Man 2099, but there were a few things that sort of went into this, right? So uh, back in 1987, Marvel had an editor-in-chief that came on board who I think was editor-in-chief for about seven years until 1994 named uh, Tom DeFalco. And Tom DeFalco had made his bones in the comic book landscape by orchestrating some pretty significant deals, right? I mean, he's the one that orchestrated the deal between Hasbro slash G.I. Joe and Marvel Comics, which is why you got like G.I. Joe comics coming out of Marvel back in the, the 1980s. He was really, really big in that, you know, on that on that front. Not to mention he he had his hand in some pretty significant stories over the years. And so the result was that um in 1992, where he was less heavy handed than Jim Shooter, insofar as Jim Shooter had this attitude as, as editor in chief, like if your stories are late, you're fired in terms of writing or, or, or artist work. This is the direction that Marvel's going in. If you're on board with it, awesome, you can stay. If not, you're fired. The guy was pretty heavy handed. DeFalco was a lot less heavy handed, right? It was almost like this total 180, this paradigm shift away from what, what Jim Shooter had done. And it was one of these things where it was kind of like, just let's explore some ideas and let's just see what happens, you know, and whatever, whatever goes on, goes on. Um, and and the result was that in, in 1992, Marvel ended up launching Marvel 2099. And this really, again, came out of, of, a, of the amazing Spider-Man. And this was this was really just like the introduction of Miguel O'Hara. And for the most part, it was hugely popular with, with Spider-Man because it's Spider-Man, right? I mean, pretty much anything Spider-Man related will sell in Marvel comics. Even if it's not the most popular among like the, the super hardcore hipster comic fans or, or what have you, for the most part, among the casual comic book buying audience, it's popular. It'll always do well. That's the reason why he's the face of the company. Uh, and so with, with with Miguel O'Hara being introduced, he was different from Peter Parker insofar as uh, Miguel O'Hara actually worked for the company that he that he basically fought against, right? And in the year 2099, it was really more this idea that like corporations rule the world, right? And Alchemax was the biggest out of all of them. And so Miguel O'Hara worked for Alchemax, but at the same time worked to try to bring it down, right? So it's like if Peter Parker worked for uh, worked for for the Daily Bugle and was trying to like bring the company down at the same time, right? So um, because of that, like Marvel ended up launching a handful of other imprints, or I guess a handful of other titles that came after that, right? So we started getting things like, like uh, I think it was Ravage, which was written by Stan Lee, I'm pretty sure it was. Um, we got the Incredible Hulk. We ended up getting stories later on, like Doctor Doom. Uh, Doctor Doom was actually designed to shift the, the Marvel 2099, uh, 2099 universe from where it was to, you know, to, to like a, a different take, right? So that's why they put AD at the end of uh, all the stories that came after Doctor Doom. But there were a, a lot of really cool concepts that came out of it. But, but really the biggest reason why it worked so well is because it wasn't really grounded in anything, right? It was just kind of out there. It wasn't really tied to anything. It was just sort of out there, right? Now, uh, more recently and in, in more recent years, Marvel has basically solidified that like, it's the absolute future of, of the main Marvel universe, right? Like the year 2099, that's the future. Like we will we will pass 2099 and go forward from there into 2100 and 2300 and the year 3000 and, and so on and so forth. But everything that transpires in the 2099 continuity will happen, right? There's no getting around that. There's no deviating that. It's not an alternate reality. It's not days of future past or anything like that. It's the absolute future. Um, but at the time that it was being made, it was basically like, this is a potential future that exists out there and we may or may not see it. And so seeing possible futures from Marvel was exceedingly popular at the time. Um, and so with the other, you know, other iterations of characters that we got, Punisher and, and, and a lot of those guys, uh, it sold pretty well. The issue with this is that by the time you got into the comic bust of the mid 1990s, Marvel ended up shutting it down. Or, you know, by, or at least by, by 1998, Marvel ended up shutting it down. And the way this played out again is, is, is we've talked about the, the comic bust of the 1990s. And so far as uh, if you were buying comics and, and trying to trade comics before or 1971, then it was just kind of like, who knows how much your comic's worth, right? It's worth whatever your local retailer will, will, will give it, you know, give you for it based on how many people are coming in and ask for, asking for the comic, right? So if nobody's coming in and asking for DC Showcase number four, which was the first appearance of the Flash Barry Allen, then you're going to get pennies for it. Whereas if people are coming in all the time and trying to get their hands on it, well, then it's going to be worth a whole lot more. Now, the reason why I say 1971 is because that's when the Overstreet Price Guide was invented. And that was basically how much your comic was worth on a national 
scale, right? So you had a bargaining chip. You could go into your comic book retailer and you could say, I've got DC Showcase number four and, and according to the Overstreet Price Guide, it's worth like a thousand bucks. And your retailer would say, I'm gonna give you 500. And it's like, I'll just take my business elsewhere. I'll write to some publisher out there somewhere in, in some company or some, some other state and I'll tell them that I have this comic and, and take pictures and send it to them, I guess, if that was a readily available technology of the time. Uh, if it was, I don't, I don't know. I'm, I never really familiarized myself with photography in the 1970s. Um, and then in turn, basically kind of go back and forth through snail mail and ultimately sell the comic, right? So your retail, that retailer that, that turned you down could miss out. Uh, the reason why this matters is because what it meant was that people started buying up a whole bunch of different comics, right? Like comics that were rare or comics that were significant were suddenly worth a whole lot of money, right? So you get into like, you know, 1987 with The Dark Knight Returns, huge comic book, right? I mean, it's like the, the reboot more, not really a reboot, but like a dystopian future belonging to Batman. Everybody bought those, right? You get X-Force number one in 1991, huge deal, 91 or 92, it's, it's a huge deal. Um, X-Men volume two, issue number one in 1992, huge deal, right? So it sells like gangbusters. Actually, I think that was 91. Uh, but anyway, it sells like gangbusters. It's a great big, huge deal because they're number ones, they're comics of significance, different things like that. The Death of Superman, another really good example. What this basically meant was because retailers didn't tell Marvel or DC the fact that, that people were buying multiple copies of, of issue number ones, and all they did was say, we sold a million copies of, of, I don't know, X-Men Volume 2 issue number one over the course of the last three months that all Marvel and DC saw were overall sales. And so as a result of comic book fans as well as collectors going in and just buying up a ton of comics, uh, Marvel and DC not getting all the information they needed oversaturated the market. And that basically led to comics being worth nothing, right? It's the Red Diamond example that I use. Red Diamonds, as far as I'm aware, don't exist. Maybe they do, I don't know. But it seems like something that would be exceedingly rare, right? So if you're walking down the road and you find a Red Diamond, it's worth a ton of money until some scuba diver you know, enters some cave somewhere and finds a wall full of red diamonds and suddenly yours is worth a whole lot less. And that's basically what happened with comics. And so as a result of that, uh, Marvel in the mid 1990s was just like, if it's not overly popular, if it's not selling ex exceedingly well, cut it, get rid of it. Either that or license it out to event publications from Jimmy Palmiotti and Joe Quesada. And so Marvel 2099 was one of those publications where they were just like, it's not selling. Like it's, it's not really performing that well. We've tried to reshuffle it. We've tried to make it work. Uh, one of the big mistakes that Marvel made is they actually fired Joey Cavalieri. Uh, Joey Cavalieri was the, the editor in chief, I'm sorry, not the editor in chief, the editor of Marvel 2099 at the time and was hugely respected in the comic book community, right? Because he made his bones back in the 1980s in 1982 to 1986 writing, um, Detective Comics 521 to 580, I think? 560, something like that. Anyway, he wrote Detective Comics for a number of issues, and they were actually backup features that he was writing with Green Arrow that was in Detective Comics. Uh, he wrote Huntress issues one through 119, I th I'm sorry, one through 19, um, from 1989 to 1990, right? So like, he had a huge, he had a pretty significant involvement over the course of comics, not to mention all the other titles that he was involved in. So Marvel firing him was a huge deal because like at the time he had like Peter David, you had Warren Ellis, people like that, who were huge writers in the comic book community and who quit, right? So basically because Marvel fired Hired the editor who was well respected by the writers and artists of the community, pretty much all the writers and artists quit. <laughs> and that helped to even further sink Marvel 2099. And so ultimately in 1998, the whole imprint went belly up. Now, in recent years, Marvel has referenced it, really Miguel O'Hara, uh, Spider-Man 2099 more than anybody else. Um, but occasionally you see characters, right? So you, you, you'll read Exiles, you read the World Tour story arc from, uh, actually I think that took, uh, took place after House of M, where uh, the Exiles, this multiversal superhero team actually travels from one universe to the next. So they end up in like the future imperfect universe where the Maestro Hulk rules everything. And they also end up stopping in the um, the Marvel 2099 universe and actually end up facing off against Hulk 2099, which is a, which is a really cool idea. But, uh, but nonetheless, um, with regards to this, this, this print, this imprint, this, this, this thing, what it does, you know, in terms of putting it on Disney plus kind of moving into the you know, the, the meat and potatoes of this discussion. What it does in terms of putting it on Disney Plus is it focuses on this idea of Disney essentially taking a, a series of stories involving the characters they love and almost kind of making it what if, right? Because again, back when it first popped up in 92, Marvel was just like, this is some possible future that exists out there. Nothing may come of it, but it's just some possible future that exists out there. And that was basically it. Um, bringing it in to, to, uh, to the modern era, right? Like bringing it in into Disney Plus, it, they could basically say like, you get Iron Man 2099, you get the Incredible Hulk 
$20.99. Captain America, $20.99. These are not the absolute characters that you know. They're just a possible future that you could see, right? And they could tie it into the what ifs, right? I mean, you get like, what if Infinity War or Avengers Endgame or a combination of both, you know, like, which I think they're doing. Uh, you get Marvel 2099, which is the future of that particular storyline, right? You know, any number of things could come out of that. Uh, in Marvel Comics, we got things like X-Men 2099, right? So the, the issue that you have with that is you can only really do that once the characters are introduced, right? Because it, it, it would seem almost backwards, right? Like you bring the X-Men into onto Disney Plus into, you know, for the 2099 C, uh, TV series, and then in turn, you roll them into the movie, people are going to expect that whatever they see in the movie is going to lead to 2099, uh, which may not necessarily be the case, right? So you don't really wanna build things backwards, you wanna build things going forward. Uh, and so as a result of that, you know, things like Fantastic Four, like we saw in the comics, things like X-Men, like we saw in the comics, I would hold off on those. But in terms of seeing the characters that we have seen at the moment, the core Avengers, more or less, Black Widow, different characters like that, um, you could basically say 2099, because remember, that, that, 2099 version of those characters is not the same as the main Marvel Universe version. Now, they have crossed over over the years, and in fact, I think Doctor Doom and Miguel O'Hara are the only two characters from the 2099 universe that actually crossed over and met their counterparts in the main Marvel Universe, right? They basically traveled to the past and, and met like their modern day versions. I think that's the only time that ever really happened. But uh, but nonetheless, you know, it, it, it offers some pretty cool opportunity in terms of showing us things that we haven't really seen before, because that's one of the big things that the Marvel Cinematic Universe lacks at the moment, and while I do love what they've done, when you sort of take away, and, or I'm sorry, when you sort of step back and, and, and stop allowing yourself to be carried away by all the great movies that we've seen, and you kind of look at the entirety of the MCU for what it is, uh, we've got the Avengers and we've got the Guardians of the Galaxy. And that's basically it, right? And then you got a few cameos here and there. There's very little that's actually been done in terms of building up the world of the Marvel Cinematic Universe, right? Like we don't have anything to do with the X-Men. Of course, that explains itself because of the whole situation with Fox and, and those characters. Same thing with the Fantastic Four. Uh, Spider-Man's back in Sony now, so who the heck knows how that's gonna turn out. But in terms of bringing in groups like, like I don't know, like Factor 3, and bringing in groups like, um, I don't know, like Squadron Supreme, basically like Marvel's version of the Justice League, Hyperion and, and those characters. You know, bringing in these various groups like the Shi'ar Empire, which as far as I'm aware, I guess is part of the X-Men from Fox, so Marvel probably couldn't have done that, but like various Avengers villains, right? So giving us the actual Mandarin and the Ten Rings. We're gonna see that in Shang-Chi, but it would have been nice to see an Iron Man because the Mandarin is a core Iron Iron Man villain. Different things like that. They haven't really built up a whole lot of that stuff. And Doctor Strange 2, we're going to see him and Scarlet Witch exploring the multiverse. So that's cool to see that multiversal, you know, expansion going on. Probably the introduction uh, of characters like Nightmare, probably seeing a little bit more of Dormammu, learning about him. Hopefully, fingers crossed, we get to learn about Zom. Let me tell you something. Zom is so powerful. It's like the one thing Doctor Strange is afraid of, right? Like if Zom shows up here, like we're all going to die. And he's not wrong. Like it's, it's Zom is crazy powerful. We've actually got a video on it if you guys want to check it out. Um, I'll have my editor put it down in the description, but there really isn't a whole lot of building going on there in terms of, of you know, the, the present, what's going on right now in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, as well as what's going on outside of Earth in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Just whatever we've seen in Guardians of the Galaxy and essentially everything has been Earth-based, which makes sense because they're essentially just now starting out, right? I mean, when you look at the Marvel Cinematic Universe in relation to everything Marvel Comics has to offer, we've hardly even stepped out the door. We've got our hand on the doorknob. That's all we've really done so far. When you consider the vast amount of stuff that's out there and the sheer number of story arcs that they could do. There's a lot to cover. And so, um, I think taking something like 2099 and leaving it out of the movies, right? Not really throwing it into the movies and latching themselves into an absolute future, but instead throwing it onto Disney Plus, giving people even more of an incentive to go and get it like they really need it. Uh, and then in turn, uh, you know, just kind of giving us a possible future based on the characters that we know, I think is a genius idea. I think it's a really, really smart idea and I think it would work. Uh, I would certainly watch it. Now, this really sort of, uh, I guess, really relies on the fact that it's well-written, the fact that the, the, the TV show is produced in an adequate way and that it doesn't feel cheap. If it ends up feeling like some really crappy, you know, cheap thing that's got a budget of, of you know, 50 bucks and pizzas for everybody who shows up, then like it sucks. And nobody wants to see that. <laughs> nobody would want to. Nobody would want to watch that because it would just feel so low quality. But uh, but again, you know, it's it's just it's one of the possibilities that are out there, and there's a lot of things you can do with it. And, and it's kind of funny because the reason why all this comes on is probably the question why people are asking you know, is why even talk about this in the first place. The reason why all this really seems to come on is because of the fact that Marvel's doing a whole bunch of 
$20.99 one shots from late November going in, you know, going all throughout December. And, and it, it kind of begs the question, why? Like what fans are out there are clamoring for the return of $20.99? No one's really asking for that. Maybe more Miguel O'Hara, you know, I mean, we've saw him from Spider-Man into the Spider-Verse. So just on that alone really begs more, you know, from, from the character regarding, you know, his comic book appearances. But I don't really hear anybody clamoring for the return of Hulk $20.99 or Doctor Doom $20.99 or, or the Avengers or the X-Men or, or Fantastic Four or anything like that. I don't really hear anybody asking for that stuff or requesting the, the return of those things. And so because of that, it's like, why in the world would they do that? And I think they're doing it because they're toying with the idea, seeing how it performs in comic book form and seeing whether or not there is a fan base there. And if there is, they can in turn roll it over and put it on a Disney Plus. I think it's kind of what they're looking at at the moment. As far as I'm aware, they haven't announced it. Uh, they haven't said they're going to do anything with it. But I have a feeling that with something like this, it, that's the only reason it seems to make sense. Either that or they just want to see what happens. <laughs> They're doing it for the sake of doing it, which is entirely possible. You know, who, who knows? But with that being said, guys, we're going to go ahead and bring this video to an end. If you are new here to Comics Explained, make sure you guys hit the sub button to become part of the Rob Corps. If you guys enjoyed this video, make sure you drop a like, and I will catch you all later. Peace.